Hello, I'm Christopher Payne. I'm a founder and editor-in-chief here at Fine Print. This here is Sepia. She's our intern. Um, during these uncertain times, we wanted to provide you with some kind of content where you're cooped up at home. Oh, you got some work to do? Uh, so we are launching this new virtual reading series. Uh, we're calling it Fine Print Press Play. Uh, we're going to showcase authors reading from around the world uh, from their locations. And uh, we hope that that will bring you some kind of creative content where you're cooped up. Uh, we're going to do this series as long as we can. Um, and maybe it's something we'll even continue to do after this crisis is over. Uh, everything that's been going on has also disrupted the uh, distribution of our magazine. Uh, we do have issue 8, which came out right before uh, all of this really started to unfold. Uh, that's hot off the press. We have copies here. Um, we are happy to mail these to you anywhere you are in the world. Um, to do that, it costs $3. That covers uh, postage in an envelope. Uh, magazine itself is free. You can do that with this brand new issue or any of the past issues that we still have available. Um, to do that, just visit fineprintpaper.com. Uh, we do have some other swag on there as well. If you want to pick up anything to help support us during these times, um, that option is there as well. Uh, we hope everyone out there is staying safe. Uh, we love everyone in this uh, great creative community, and um, we look forward to seeing you all in the new world. Hi everyone, greetings from Pennsylvania. My name's Claire Welsh, I'm a poet based up here. And I'm gonna read a couple poems for you today. I'm wearing my hat in honor of Kenny Rogers, who of course yeehawed into the next life just yesterday. So let's see here. I think the first poem I'm gonna read is called The Gift goes like this. Onward, the Greyhound bus, the dripping air conditioner, the asbestos ceiling swollen as the O in home. Onward, home, the shape-shifting question. I don't know if I'm full of love or rain. I see myself in the station bathroom mirror glass scratched with the word help and want you there deep in help under the light burning beauty from tile skin help the word carved with the edge of a dime would I fidget in the scratch off tickets in wishing fountains lotteries break my heart but I play them for the chance of sitting with you in a house that won't weep you the reason I have traveled so far, an old woman drooling on my shoulder. Like a cartoon mouse dodging a hammer, I flee credit debt, which pounds cracks through walls I don't own. The lie is love, only happens to women with salon budgets. The fear is poverty will disfigure us past gifting each other gas station coffees. Did you think here in America, you could rip love from money without killing someone? Impossible, like ripping blood from land. I believe in marrying for health insurance because I believe in staying alive for love. When I hear the word marriage, I see a room of hundreds of $10 knives, but the part of me blind and deaf to advertising brushes God not the war criminal, but the orgasm. Help. I want to give you more than my broken fingernails, the smudged bus window, and the stars beyond it. Orion, club raised to Taurus, my zodiac sign, and so, if life is more than survival, sacred. I can always find my hunter my traveling lights stretching to crack my skull. 
finding myself on this planet raging in space will take the rest of my life? Am I selfish? Asking you to share that debt a hole within a hole? I will never be one of the rich, raised on Instagram, normcore swimwear, colonizing beaches, coastal elite brunch chatter, proposing philanthropy to those of us who never pulled up a trust fund like a bootstrap. I am what well-meaning debutantes call charity, which could only humiliate me if they were poets from my country. I am a patriot of elsewhere. I am rich in the currency of stars. The highway is my wedding dress. My fortune, feathers, falling from birds scattered by gunshots. The sparrow in the station hops on the neighboring bench, chirps a note. Song, the only gift rising from thin air. All right, so I'm gonna read a couple more. That last one I wrote while I was on the Greyhound bus, which is a time where you have a lot of space and time to write. Kind of like right now, quarantine feels like being on a Greyhound bus, except that we don't know where we're going and we don't know when we'll get there. So let me see here. This next one I'm gonna read is based on a dialect we have here in Pennsylvania called Pennsylvania Dutch. Pennsylvania Dutch. Our gloss for Deutsch. Our bastard German sprung like a flock of moths from the mouth of a wolf. In the so-called new world, each settler word lost a father to his own hands. The way a man splits his heart in the smaller meat Every time he raises a fist, so her tongues shrank. This is how civilizations justify violence, by yanking nettles from words and then forgetting them. When hunting fawn, wolves maul the face first so their prey won't cry for help. Rapists, too, cover the mouths of their victims. An alphabet of silenced women flickers across my phone screen. Can a fragment persist forever? Settlers name the land virgin to justify taking it. This done in tremulous poetry recited in high schools. Another scripture stuffed in a musket barrel. Another amnesia smoothing the mercy stone of memory. When the time to speak my story would no longer stay back from the torch I lit to keep it away. I reached for my dagger of old German, glued thorns back on the stems of words. My silence would have been nice, patriotic even, but I was always more woods than woman, more stag blowing vapor than any gender. When I say I don't believe pain leaves us speechless, I mean the speech of pain melts diamonds back into the mine, drops anthems from air. Once I found a fawn with her goose flesh nose ripped open, Pennsylvania, you are not the lyric, but the droning breath of her hull. All right, so I think I have time for one or two more poems here. Uh, this one's a love poem. It's called, You're Losing Your Fight with God. And you never looked better. Your burnt tongue of curses cooled to silver coins. Your lip cut on the desert wind you summoned, knowing full well it would thin your hair. That's the deal, honey. That's the price for sucking the American lyric from the tit of a wolf. You can't stay glossy hot. You become bent photograph hot, broken church organ hot. Asbestos flakes from your fingertips and all the secrets you've kept sink under your eyes. You're tired, but your fire like a horse sleeps standing up. These days, you let them. 
Wait till he's ready to fling open the door, jump on his back, and run. If I had met you before you stopped whipping yourself, we would have broken each other. The horses inside us snapping for jugglers like gas lines rising under wallpaper. And yes, you're still a young man, but I could not love that younger man you envy. I needed you to survive him. All right, y'all, looks like I have time for one more. This is a poem I wrote just recently here in quarantine about the experience of playing Final Fantasy VII as a kid. It's called Limit Break. I play Final Fantasy VII with my neighbor's cola crusted controller wired to a dusty console hooked to a square TV. I am a spiky avatar soldier. And though off-screen my body with her new tits and lip-piercing citizens a country drone-striking Pakistan every 43 days, my weapon is a sword. Inside the game, I cross-slash my nemesis, a corporation sucking green light from the planet. Outside the game, the gas company drills deep, leaks methane over my high school. The water in the faucet catches fire. My soldier avatar falls melancholy. A blue text box from his buddy observes, there ain't no getting off of this train. A decade passes. We're all still here on the train. Me, my neighbor and his sticky fingers, my spiky avatar soldier, his buddy with guns for hands and our parallel worlds girdled by old bastards who like rapey gods, make themselves felt in pixels. The small rooms we pace like flame-tailed dogs. Our cells flinch from each other. On this train we call planet, we quarantine in separate cars. Final Fantasy VII gets re-released with more realistic graphics because when the sky smells of sun-rotten fish, we'll pay anything for a fist of nostalgia, some clenched yarrow to rub into our scabs. When I play the game again, it is not a game. I wait for my limit break to omnislash myself into place. I wait myself weak. Green light erupts from the smokestacks. The flower girl dies. All right, thanks y'all. Thanks for listening. This is Rogan Kelly and I'm reading for fine print paper. I want to thank Chris and Dylan and the fine print team uh, for giving me the opportunity. I'm going to read a couple new poems and then, uh, and then the poem I published with fine print. This is called Stole Salt from the Gravy You Borrowed. We were bright and new like an early girl tomato. You put me to work at once and I liked it. The honeydew, the honeybee. We bought fuses together, didn't fit the fixture. The wild length of you held the rickety ladder. I climbed the top step, fell hard like all that. At the hardware store with the dickhead behind the counter, you proved the better boy, sweet but impatient, always in a hurry for the next best thing. And yet, when you cooked, and damn did you cook, all slow simmer and salt, you only asked me you only asked for me to be at your table at the steady ready, to have it hot and heavy and on your time. I felt seen in your hands. It's called On the Bowery. I want to go on one of those nature walks where we're spent past the point of complaint, where I ask how much longer and you say, two, two more sand dunes yet. As we crossed Bond and Bowery, and you whisk me from street vendors to the lobby bar, where we practice our whiskey and our whiskey, where you lean heavy on my neck and speak into the jugular of this city. The brisk sweat of us, as potent as our want and need.
It's called Starless Night, Wingdale Farm. So dark on the farm, we couldn't make each other out. You asked me what I wanted before the rooster and the dawn. I first deflected, then deferred. You braved the hickory floor and boom pitch corridor. Your silo frame missed a step, and I willed myself across the room to break your fall. We drove ten miles in the wrong direction, looking for anything that might start a fire. Crossed into Kent, then back. The world so dark, our headlights only found more black. Smartphone rendered cold brick. If the gas attendant hadn't handed me that wedding white matchbook, I would have believed us the only two alive. And for this one, <laughs> um, so. beautiful new issue of fine print. This is my fine print pen note on the fancy, very important jean jacket. But I have nowhere to go out looking fancy like this. We're all cooped up. <laughs> I don't want to bend this. Um, this is called the old ale, the old ale house, and. Um, it has a cameo by a, a dear poet friend of mine, uh, Philip F. Clark. So a shout out to Philip. Uh, it has an epigraph by E. E. Cummings. I was sitting in McSorley's. Outside it was New York and beautifully snowing. Convinced you were over me, kicked up like sawdust, put away like the light and dark swill we drank to little or no effect. I retreated to the corner, tucked myself between the table and the wall. Philip explained, the man was hung like a horseradish. Only a chef would get the joke. The two of you holding court in the back room, owning the joint, joyous enough the gods might hear. Both of you debonair and daring, the dyad making inroads to my heart. The idle man took drink orders brought us only meager fries. Thank you again, Fine Print. Thank you for the opportunity. Everybody take care of yourselves, all right? In the beginning, living in piles of lead paint, mom told us not to stand in front of the microwave. The word cancer like a clogged drain. We already knew about the Frankensteinian removal of thyroids, stuffed dogs' heads sewn on wrong, in broad daylight, the defrost button, a delicate bomb. But at night, we tiptoe down the back stairs, press our temples to the slotted heat vent, and whisper, that's it, I'm ready, press start. For the washable tattoo atop a permanent scar. Whether a fire, cancer, slip of the wrist with a razor in the shower, the only evidence left is a pale sheen of fingerprintless disbelief in skin rebuilt, fine lines flattened into unidentifiable cropland gone fallow, black thumb all through summer, and the soil spits blood back. But look, there is a painted piece of paper that obviously wants to cover the world up, and it's whatever color you want it to be, baby. Golden, lavender, ruby, little fistful of familiar confettiing over a headstone like it's New Year's in hell. To think, the attention, welcome for once and stuffed with wet petals, when they fall off were different, crystalline coats fully saturated, weighted down with old gods in the pockets to keep from floating away. I wish anyone could say reconstructive and mean it, but they're always sort of smirking. 
Fine that the stitches stay in. Fine that the willows bend over just to fuck us. If not for the tumor's contusions, what would we cover in tinsel and expensive juices? These are the landmarks that tell extinction it's moving in the right direction. Unhook the horror from the head wound and be honest. Even the lilies better gilded. So what's next? After first freak out, reinvest your Roth and gold and stock up on non-perishables. Nest egg for the apartment because you're not allowed to leave it. We thought Armageddon would be one thing. The heat, galactic collision, runaway gods come home to roost. But it's everything. Cleared throat in the boardroom. Honeybee under my boot. Stench around St. Rose, Louisiana. I've saved a little money for when university degrees go back to their original lives as tree pulp, for when my bosses finally read my poetry, for when the system blows over in strong wind, no revolution necessary, the top-heavy odds will take care of it. We track the numbers of global and local infected, like we can cost-benefit a way out, map a route someplace else, hitch our trailer to the twilight zone, but no such love, no such sweet carry-on. Despite our deepest wishes, we keep existing. Nonchalant crisis after nonchalant crisis. Sometimes I am sick and tired of being a lawful citizen. Sometimes I unhook all the fasteners of my outfit and let the breeze comb through my ghost cloud. The contagious never touch, but I would risk it under the right barbed wire, crescent gap toothed smiling. I would place your palm on what can perish and let you feel the muscled engine wrenching oceanic in its monsters faster and faster. Between the siren rails at equal intervals in our separate little cordoned off catacombs, we hear tires screech over and over, but no collision. Like someone's doing donuts in an empty intersection, daring anyone in charge to stop them. The new normal is criminal whiplash, reckless tonguing subway turnstiles. I drop my fibroid spittle in the center of Wall Street and wait two weeks for the future to incubate. Anticlimax of bored biology, passing around half-dead RNA strands. I'm afraid to lift the dumpster lid without gloves, water the plants without a bandana around my nose and mouth. The fountains stop pumping. The salons close up shop. No backyard boils this crawfish season, but we still porch sit six feet apart. Raise our rye from afar. Trash talk tone deaf spring breakers. Sex our exes. Learn to work from home. Plant root vegetables. Calculate the risk of getting sick. If one day we come to miss the phenomenon of fucking too much to resist. Swallow the rest of the acid for kicks. I wake up the next day to a beetle tickling my ankle and its back end has those little pincers on it. And I kill it with my favorite boot. High heeled black suede and full of grace at the hour of death. Amen. Black suede and full of grace at the hour of death. Amen. Back when I was someone called Baby, the foxes strutted right up to me, like the astounded could be counted. But now the bird seed propelled across your property is not my prerogative. Uncanny bait for neighborhood strays, lying in wait, under the sound your blood makes mid-curdle at the edge of the car wreck. You're eternally surviving, altar boy, watching your mother's lungs collapse into a diamond. So tight, it's like the overgrowth at the edge of the highway is just spreading its tendrils of quiet over her face for the rest of every Saturday without exception. There is no religious candle for this, no poem that could do better than a stage actor faking a limp. Your Carolina isn't mine to miss, but when has that ever stopped it from lowering its pink toes into the pools of my horror where the cop cars always come too late to catch the wipeout hot on camera? And there's a pull cord to a frozen lake where we make sure there is no marker. 
everyone. Um, Chris from Fine Print asked me to read poems for 10 minutes. So I'm going to read poems for 10 minutes. This is from Kokomo. This was published last year, 2019, by Disorder Press. And it has beautiful artwork of alligators and whatnot by Orion Safre Proust. Then we were very lucky to get to work with her on that. So the poems are untitled. Absent mindedly touching the tip of America. After we fucked, I felt gentle. I screwed up a cake I was working on, but decided to keep feeling gentle anyway, which seemed beautiful. I tried to think of four other things that were beautiful, but all of them were you. We've been living here two months, but the cat is still waiting to leave. You seem to notice I'm watching you for signs that you're an alien. You seem to think that you're an alien. Men always think like that. The world outside is ending. That is still an optimistic thought. I wish everyone would go away. In an empty town, I would sit on the street in the sun and read a book and learn how to operate the streetcar. My cat doesn't like it when I talk. Such a dude. I don't think I'll ever live by the ocean again, unless the ocean rises up in time to meet me here. I think you would like it in the place I grew up. People mainly want to drink there. You're always saying there's no time, like that episode of Saved by the Bell where Jesse takes caffeine pills. There are no good recipes for cucumbers. I've decided to be a better person. So far this calls for being home a lot, for being alone a lot. I try to avoid doing bad things. I find that I'm able to invent new ways of being bad. I guess I do this because I'm evil. I don't want to be. But if you can't be bad, you can't be good either. Tomorrow when I wake up, I will blink, blink, blink into the sun. I hope I will rem remember to be thankful for the heat. I hope it doesn't make me feel sick. In my dream, a little murder boy is making murders with a small butter knife. Murder boy goes to McDonald's. Where does my love belong in the dream? I wake up forgetting. All the women are crazy. Everyone I know. The men are crazy too. Everyone seems like they're losing their minds. When I try to be in you, it works out bad. There is no place to put me then. I'm so grateful for you trying to fuck me when I'm sad. You think to cheer me, but I'm a miserable cunt. Why is my heart sad now? I got beamed into a sad book. For two days reading it, I had a terrible secret. And when I finished, no one could understand me. The world had changed. I hope you thought that poem was okay. I'm trying to make a career. I am a criminal. One poet said, if I don't start leaving the house, my poetry will suffer. But I'm tired of going places. It's hot. Everywhere looks like crap. You want to hear about how I'm cheating on my boyfriend secretly while he's at work, but it isn't true. I'm not like that. I'm just suffering like a normal person. Politics are a lie. Beauty is a lie. 
Fame is a lie. My country is a lie. My father is a lie. I never met my father. I said 11 wrong things today. I stopped going to funerals. The pastor is a lie. The family is a lie. The corpse is a lie. For my first eight years, I didn't know I was alive. Then my grandma put some butterflies in a jar and their wings stopped and we placed their bodies behind glass. Sometimes when I'm alive now, I can't remember what I've said, but when I feel love, I feel like my heart could stop. If we're completely quiet, we can understand each other. A moment ago, I thought about dying, but when I looked at you, it seemed all right. I'm going deeper inside myself and deeper into this apartment. I've got my favorite stuffed animal. Tomorrow, we'll rearrange the furniture. There will be a little table next to my favorite chair and some plants. Not crying for you, not bringing dinosaurs back to life and making them go extinct again, not raising hell, not telling you my dreams. You woke up gagging, thinking about milk. Yesterday, a chicken made you sick, and you are right. We met just now. Already the house is overrun with insects. How far should we let it go on? scraping by. When I go to sleep, I look at your face. Please don't cheat on me, I say. You say, I won't. It makes me sick trading one kind of violence for another. In a dream, I'm throwing things at his body. Food, chairs, scissors, rocks. I'm saying, you thought you were so cool. His family is trying to protect him until they finally ask, finally, what did he do? And I answer them and they understand. I have totally forgotten what it's like to feel beautiful. I must have been a little girl. I must have had no thoughts. I don't feel beautiful if you're dying. I look at my cat and don't feel beautiful. I hear music and don't feel beautiful. I read poetry and don't feel beautiful. It seems like dreams aren't really the kind of thing you'd have to deal with, but sometimes they are like a large expensive oak table appearing suddenly in your living room. What I want to do to you is something like what men do to women. Don't be afraid. Women are never afraid in porn. The women are so strong. Look at the men. You gentle boy with your parade in your arms, with your eyes rolling and fluttering, your stumble shit, you are from another world. Some days I don't want to tell you there are very dark ways to feel. I think I'll die under a bridge. It's so easy to disappear. You just walk until you can't see yourself. It was the worst year of my life again, in the worst city. Where do I get this idea that everything should be different? What does it mean when my phone is predicting me? Everyone seems to be doing well. I spend New Year's Eve standing in the rain, looking at a TV screen. I've been thinking about maybe not making it through the next few years. When I say I'm doing okay, I mean thinking about death like 40% of the time. What does it mean when you say it? I'm not sure what it means to be alive, especially now. You say I'm from Kokomo. It hurts sharp like a knife in the head. I want to keep walking. The trees look so green. You went to look at the river last night. 
How did it seem? I think that's probably 10 minutes, so I think we'll leave it off for there, there for now. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Subscribe, whatever. Bye.